talking about uh, iMates and simplifying assemblies. Um, and honestly, when I originally made this title, I, I didn't consider the ramifications of that naming scheme, but uh, largely we're going to be talking about constraints today and how to um, reduce repetitive tasks and assemblies is what I'm getting at in the large part, but um, should be good. I think it covers a lot of different levels of complexity and I think there should be something for everyone here. Um, is that it? Yeah, sounds uh, good. Yep. Yeah. All right, huh? Yeah, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and type them into the panels uh, during the webinar and we'll go ahead and answer those at the end or I'll just answer them in the back here as well while Adam is uh, is going through this. So uh, without further ado, Adam, please take it away. Cool. All right. Let's uh, let's jump into this, shall we, ladies and gentlemen? Um, this is uh, me. That's Adam Evangelista. I'm an application engineer here at Kativ Technologies. It means I do a lot of the support cases. It means I do a lot of these presentations and trainings. Um, and uh, basically we just, you know, we know all the different applications that we sell as a company. And so it goes quite a, quite a breath here, right? I do some of the lifeline support, some of the training, I do inventor, I do 2D, I do vault data management and the like. If you have any questions at all, of course, we'll be talking about inventor today, but if you have any questions about any of the other software, we could talk about that too, if you really like to. Previous experience, I used to work at a makerspace over Salamitos, which was a community run workshop where people would come in and make their crazy ideas, you know, stuff like CNC, laser cutter, 3D printing and stuff like that. Um, made a lot of things back there and we're still helping people make things now here too. So uh, that's great. Let's go to the next slide, Adam. Let's look at that. Uh, today, I do want to set a kind of a context here. So I'm going to start by just talking about the problem really quickly. Um, so this is this is a question for you, Nigel, and possibly anyone in the crowd, honestly. Uh, how many times has this happened to you guys? You show up Monday morning and your first task is, uh, go ahead and build this, why don't you, Nigel? Go ahead and lay 100 million rivets into some sheet metal and constrain to an assembly. Or uh, worse yet, you have something like, this where you have a bunch of small moving parts all connected together in various ways that are uh, need to be constrained and placed into an assembly. I'm not sure how many occurrences are in that particular model, but there's a lot of different occurrences in that model. Or perhaps, um, you know, you show up, you're like, oh man, how the heck am I gonna place all of these constraints in this large multitude of components? Um, it's a, it's a reasonable question. And I know some of the people on the call, you're probably already looking at some of these um, some of these pictures on the screen, you're like, okay, there's probably a polar symmetry there. There's probably some rectangular symmetry there. You could probably use patterns and get away with it pretty well. Um, but what if you had a, a keyboard like this? <laughs> this is a 65% keyboard over here. And similar to the other pictures on screen over there, there are a lot of individual components to constrain in place, right? Uh, typically, in general, when you approach CAD problems like this, you're looking for some kind of symmetry to, you know, use some kind of simplification and some kind of pattern features to go about your way. Those aren't always relevant. And what I want to talk about today is how I approach this keyboard problem and how I figured out how to, or how I wanted to simplify the placing of all these different keycaps for my own, um, for my own ends. And so, in that regard, you know, how the heck do you place multiple tedious, many constraints and components into an assembly, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. Um, in particular, I'm gonna be talking about some of these solutions over here. And so first off, of course you could use a pattern, mirror feature commands to simplify the placement of all of your different assemblies, right? Um, it goes without saying, but the pattern feature could always be used at the part level. It could also be used at the assembly level. Um, and the mirror command itself helps you place different levels of symmetry into your model as well to help kind of expedite that whole process. Um, there's some like small ones there that I just want to cover and get out of the way right off the bat, just so you guys could see um, what exactly these tools are kind of meant for and the kind of extent you could push them. Um, there's also iMates, which a topic that honestly doesn't come up too often. I do think it was a reasonable solution for, you know, some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about here today, but I want to talk about iMates, how they're used, why they're used, and how to set those up in the first place. Um, there's some workflows that incorporate iMates into uh, Content Center and the like as well. Um, I, I don't know if we'll get too into that, honestly, because it's, it's a bit of a hassle, to be honest. But uh, at the very least, I'll show you guys iMates, how to use them, and how to you know, actually get them going, because it has at least one really strange keystroke that you need to use to actually get those going. But iMates are a good alternative to just using regular padding, if you don't have that kind of love symmetry at that point. Okay. 
A third option, which I'm particularly excited about, is uh, use iLogic, right? For anyone in the crowd that's not familiar with iLogic, it's essentially, um, well, I, can I call it a scripting language, would you say, Nigel? Like iLogic is kind of just the programming interface for Inventor that lets you uh, run particular commands, use programming logic and the like to help automate and auto and um, make conditional tasks in Inventor. So that'll be kind of nice to see and we'll see how that goes. But for the moment, are there any questions right off the bat or have I lost anyone already? <laughs> I think we're doing okay. So. Let's go on to the next card here, which is a demo slide. And let's go ahead and open up some files and see what's going on here, okay? We got that guy. I prepared a few files here already that we'll talk about really quickly. And so first things first, I do have a simple little assembly over here. And so uh, I'm gonna open up this part and we're gonna take a look at the kind of problem that we have here essentially. All right, so first things first, you get some kind of assembly, you get some kind of part and has a bunch of holes in it, for example, and you're like, okay, cool, now I need to go ahead and constrain this. You can see that there is, you know, a, this is very much a, a tutorial piece right here, but you can see various blocks placed in various places. You know, you could already imagine there is probably some functionality using patterns, there is some functionality using mirrors to kind of do your business and stuff like that. And I just want to talk about the kind of that's associated with that. So first off, uh, first level of complexity, trying to simplify make constraints, use a pattern feature, right? When I come into an assembly, which I'll open up over here, and this is just an assembly file with this uh, little whole block placed into it. Uh, and from here, right, you would normally start placing components. And in fact, I'll go ahead and open that up as well, just so I can take a look at it. So, I parts, da, 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 da. Let's look at this dowel part. Um, and so to spare you guys the extra, you know, crafting <laughs> demonstration over here, uh, this is a simple dowel part that I made, right? It's a simple suited cylinder. There's a chamfer on the end over here just to kind of give it some directionality, right? If we were to do this normally, uh, uh, if we were going to do this normally, uh, oh, I think there's a chat message. I'm not sure if I see that. Please feel free. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and so this is a a dowel part here, it's, it's a pretty simple model over here. So there's nothing fancy about this right now. And if I were to go about this really right, I could go ahead and place this part in here, come in here, bring in my dowel part. And you guys might be familiar with this process already. Right, what do we have to do? Okay, well, we could get our constraint tool. We could go do our inserts. Insert itself is already kind of a benefit because you could save yourself a few clicks. Might be coming the wrong solution over here so you could switch it and there you go. You know, if you're super savvy, you could click apply, keep the window open, and you could place another constraint over there, right? This is admittedly all pretty straightforward, right? And for all intents and purposes, I could absolutely just sit here and click all of these holes and get these dowels in there, right? Um, but that's not really what today's about. Today's about how to figure out how to do that without all the clicks and without all the time consumption, right? Because while this is a relatively small part, as we all know, parts could get more complex and the problems could get a lot more complex from here. And so what's a guy to do? Well, the first option, like I mentioned, is using a pattern command, right? I have two particular features over here on this block over here. And we'll take a look at this extrusion itself so we can what's going on here. And these are two identical arrays of holes over here. This first one, I made these holes using a pattern command in the sketching environment, right? And that's totally fine. And in this next extrusion over here on the bottom, I made the extrusion as a single hole and then I patterned it out at the bottom over here, right? And so this is a particular workflow that I don't see people use all the time, or I, I'm not sure if many people are aware of it in particular or the nuances of it. But um, what I'm gonna try to do here, I'm gonna try to first place the block right into this location over here using a regular insert command, bada bing, bada boom. Thirds. And, you know, if you wanted to, you can get in place the other five instances of the style to those parts. Um, to save myself some time, I'm going to actually use the pattern command. Um, and I see people use the pattern command a lot where they default to the, you know, rectangular or the circular array commands over here, which are great and act largely as they do at the part and sketch level. 
could specify the number of instances and the number of distances. And if you're particularly wary of your parameters, you could set up and load that data into this particular assembly so that you could you know, uh, slot in the, that exact spacing that you need over here. Kind of a hassle. If you have a feature pattern, if a, a pattern feature in your part, however, you can choose this first tab and you can actually select a, uh, a pattern feature from the part that'll automatically fill this all out for us, right? Got a component still. And that's gonna populate the entire uh, pattern over there per the original feature in the part level, okay? If I were to do that same thing, I'm gonna bring in a copy over here and I were to get to do that for this top section over here. Make sure I choose the insert constraint, these two guys, solution apply. And I tried to do the same thing over here. Um, doesn't really pick it up because the top line, as I said earlier, isn't a part level feature, it's a sketch pattern feature in particular. And so, um, I don't know, I always thought the nuance was kind of frustrating because it seems like a really small point to make over there. Uh, but the idea is, you know, when you're designing original part, right, you don't necessarily want to make your sketch as complicated as possible as you did, uh, as I did with this first one over here, right? And so this is kind of a best practices thing where I get this question a lot, right? Should I make the sketch more complicated or should I just take it to the part level, make the part edits at the part level, right? In this case, right, I do get these five holes right off the bat just using the sketch and I could use the command over here if I wanted to. And just for my point, this is a pattern command, right? So I just, I sketched out this whole, uh, patterned out this hole across a few extra instances. Um, that doesn't help me though in the end because when I go to my assembly, I can't actually use that pattern feature to instance this out. Um, it's large, it's in general better to just go ahead and make a part level pattern so that I could go ahead and use it to inform my assembly level workflows over here, right? Kind of a small point, but you know, that might be, I found it confusing for some customers where it's not really clear when you can use that pattern command or not. Um, that said, uh, interestingly enough, um, if I go ahead and select the pattern, select the components, select the pattern again, I could still um, I could still select the pattern feature down here, and it'll still space it out accordingly. Um, so the part's not exactly in that pattern feature. However, it's taking that spacing and instancing information and applying it to my original part selection up there, anyways, which is kind of cool, right? The whole idea is if you have part level pattern feature, it lets you inform not just that singular instance, but multiple instances of that pattern later on in the assembly level. Right, so that's just kind of a nice way to keep track and um, kind of work with the part level commands, right? And uh, I think that's typically the level a lot of people get to in terms of simplifying their constraints, right? Um, and it, it's totally fine, and that totally works with simple symmetry and simple patterns that you could get away with, right? Absolutely no problem with that. Um, however, you might be you might end up in more complex situations where the constraints are not necessarily as simple as a pattern. You can't really get with a pattern command. You get this with a pattern command, mind you, this, these configuration four holes over here, but for simplicity's sake and the, <laughs> the conversation today, let's just say that these weren't made with a pattern and still had to fill out you know, eight of these holes with an extra mate over there. What are some other options for ourselves at this point? Well, um, moving beyond the standard pattern operations that are available for us. Uh, there's also these great things called iMates available for us, right? Um, I guess, um, I, I don't know if we have a poll question or anything, but I guess I'm curious if anyone uses iMates in the crowd because iMates is one of the things that I always thought was really interesting. I just, I don't see many customers use it or take advantage of it. And, uh, and honestly, you know, looking into this and researching this topic for this particular presentation, I could kind of understand why, you know, it's kind of a subtle advantage that you get from using iMates and everything like that. But um, I do think it is kind of a nice workflow to be aware of anyways, because it is relatively simple to implement um, at the end of the day. And so, right on. Thank you, Andrew. It's like iMates are nice just because they are um, an easier way to simplify placing constraints overall. A very basic level, right? Um, Absolutely, yeah. So um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as we get further into this. And so iMates are simpler parts. And so um, if you've ever looked into the managed environment, uh, the managed environment's 
I don't know. I've been spending a lot of time here in the manage environment recently, but the manage tab has not just your styles and features and everything, but you also have your eye parts. It has your eye mates, which we're going to be talking about here today. It has your component authoring, which we have today, which we'll probably talk a little bit about today. <laughs> it also has your content center editor as well. So a lot of higher level functionalities are actually saved to the um, manage tab. So if you're curious, there's a lot of good stuff here. If you just pick a single button, get some good information. Um, so what is an iMate? That's a good question. If we click on iMate, we can see it's a relatively normal box, right? And if you're familiar with constraints, this box, uh, um, I'm sure already looks pretty familiar to you, right? Um, the only difference from the regular constraint dialog box is that there's only one selection available here uh, in the selection section. And so the way that iMates were designed to me initially, iMates are essentially just a half a mate that's available for you to use if you'd like, which is pretty much what it is. And so what I'm doing right here is that I, I could assign a certain feature or a, uh, a certain selection on the part on screen and I can let that become an iMate. And so it just means that whenever I place this in the future, this iMate is gonna be looking for its match somewhere else in the assembly, right? How we find that other match is um, another subject for conversation and stuff like that. But I wanted to demonstrate how this typically goes from here, okay? Talking about iMates, right? You use a different uh, type of constraint available to you guys. Um, I'm going to use the insert constraint for simplicity once again. And once you choose the type of assembly, you can still choose the offset like a regular constraint. You can still choose a selection and the solution over here. I'm going to choose this uh, leading edge on the non-chamfered side over there. And uh, like we saw here, right, we want this kind of a aligned solution here with the two axes, right? So this is going to be going into the other one. In general, I've, I found it kind of hard to generalize which solution to choose whenever you go and uh, start choosing some of this. Um, you might see that a bit, later, but um, I don't, I, if you have to troubleshoot and try to figure, if you have to, you know, either or the one, I, I don't because it's not always obvious is what I'm getting at. <laughs> uh, click OK and not much changes. There's an extra little glyph on here, like a little circle, I guess. And you get another folder over here on the left for iMates, which uh, looks pretty similar to the iconography from um, regular mates and stuff like that, but we are in the part environment. And that's going to be largely what you see in the part environment. This is pretty much done at point, if that's all you really need from there. Um, go ahead and throw a save over here and come back to my whole block assembly right here. And if I wanted to, I could go in here and I could place a Dell part once again. Uh, Dell part exists here. Now, and when I click on it, you'll see that it has that same little dot over there, which is great. And you know, this does have an iMate, which is exactly what we want. And uh, I'm not sure how obvious this information is to the layman or anything, but um, if you want to actually get this to mate to something, if you want to use the iMate, you end up holding the alt. Right, so you have to select the part first, so you have that little glyph available to you. And what you have to do is hold down the key, and you click and drag from that glyph to the particular section you want to mate to. Okay, and so uh, Inventor is intelligent enough to identify the other half of the mate. This is an insert constraint. It's going to for another flat circular edge. Right? And so what we've essentially done is I've kind of kind of attached the first half of the insert constraint to this part itself. And that's represented by this little dot right here. And so instead of going back to the constraint tool, selecting my edge, selecting my edge, now all I have to do is click on my part, the alt, click and drag from the dot to another leading edge. Um, and you know, saying it out loud, I'm realizing that's actually more words than what I just described. <laughs> but um, imagine as you get kind of more complicated, then this will just save you a bit of time. And, you know, at this point, you know, I just drag in a few copies like this and, you know, I don't really have to enter a dialog box again to start placing all of these constraints. I could just go in, place them super intuitively. Um, and I don't know, I think there's something kind of nice about that right off the bat, right? You could just automatically go in and place it. Right? And you can't have multiple constraints here as well. And these dials are relatively simple, you know, but if you ever use like Content Center and you use like the auto drop features, for example, like with the bolts, um, some bolts are defined both by a uh, an insert constraint, um, I'm sorry, an axi constraint and also a flush constraint of the actual head where it's gonna actually lay flat over there. So 
Uh, the idea is that, again, these are all just half mates that are associated with your part right now. And so it's kind of just an extra way to define how your part's going to relate to the rest of your assemblies as opposed to just a solid block of geometry. And so, yeah, in general, just I mates become this kind of in-between state for parts and assemblies where normally you just have your part placed into assemblies and then you wrap it all together with explicit constraints at that point. This is just a nice way to simplify placing constraints, especially if you don't want your guys worrying about the particular, um, you know, peculiarities of each constraint. Right? So like the offset, or maybe you're dealing with some of these limits and stuff like that, or choosing the resolution and everything. To make it simpler for yourself and for everyone else using these parts, this is a good opportunity to just take advantage of iMates because, again, it's just a really simple configuration. And it just requires a bit of a you have to know to press the alt key so can you perform multiple i mates at once by control clicking all receiving locations um i don't know i've never tried it, honestly um we could try it right, right here actually why don't we give that a shot so you're saying you want to control -click all of these guys like a regular window selection let me read that again can you perform multiple i mates at once by controlling all the receiving locations I'm not sure you're saying like maybe if I had this guy, it's like multiple people here. What if I controlled click these guys? No, it doesn't let me select the edges anymore. If I have multiple selected, can I? Okay, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> I'm trying it right now. This is all my keyboard right now, so like kind of hard to demonstrate my keystrokes here. But... Yeah, it doesn't look like I place multiple uh, at the same time while I have one of the mates selected. So, yeah, it doesn't look like that's possible. Um, you're, you're seeing those other glyphs on there, and I, I believe it's just the, the parts in the back updated because I updated the definition already. Uh, so that's what we're looking at there. And so that said, like I always found iMates to be, I don't know, I like the idea of iMates a lot. and. Um, it's kind of a small thing that I don't, I don't know if it'll really change your whole world or anything or make a million dollars if you start implementing iMates and stuff. It's nice to be aware. Again, it simplifies kind of a small step that may cause it and, I don't know, make it more usable overall. Um, and at this point, I would like to also mention that iMates do go to a content center pretty well as well. So um, iMates, if I generated an iPart off of this dowel, I could have it... Um, also, just still pick up these same different sizes that you want and place it in accordingly. Um, I, I don't want to get too into this because it's just um, it's very particular the way that iMates are treated inside of um, of Content Center. And let me see if I I think I have a part already. Actually, let me open that. Well, you know what? We'll just we'll just do it really quick. I don't I told mind. And so um, first of all, to yeah. So first of all, right, there's not really much you need to do beyond this. If I want to make a content center part, I go ahead and create an I part from here, insert row, insert row. Um, and I have these set up for like half interval. This would be one, and this would be a diameter of 1.5. Um, should be all you need to do. And then from here, I could just publish this part outright. Um, and I'm also curious, um, while we get into this, uh, I'm going to publish those parts to Content Center really quickly. Um, I'm going to put it under fasteners, but the category doesn't matter for this particular um, process that I'm doing right now. Um, it's going, no parameters need to be mapped. We're going to be filtering by diameter. And this will be AVA January. Yep, AVA January, next, publish. And so there's a lot of parts inside of Content Center that already have some kind of iMating in them, which I always thought was pretty nice. Uh, but now if I go back in here, go to Content Center, go to my fasteners, go to my ABA January right here, um, I'm just going to place this part as is. And you'll notice that I do have an i button right here, right off the bat. But I'm just going to place a half, um, half inch diameter dowel right here. Um, and once I have that part, it still has the iMate in it, right? And so if you have like a really standard definition for any parts that are already going into Content Center, it's a good idea to have iMates anyways, because you know it just makes placement that much more easier. 
And to be honest, the original reason I looked into IMH was because I wanted to use uh, AutoDrop inside of Content Center. So I'm curious if anyone uses AutoDrop uh, already inside of Content Center. AutoDrop being the option over here with the red circle. Uh, AutoDrop super cool because you know you could go in here and you could like pull in like uh, one of these guys and you choose one of these bolts and it's going to automatically try to size it, right? Okay, didn't work there. So <laughs> it's going to try to size it for you automatically. Um, but the idea is, is that, you know, if the content center could find matching diameter for whatever you're going to click, it helps you go ahead and choose that in and you go ahead and click it in there. And this part gets sized and placed and constrained all kind of in one kind of workflow over there. Right. And you can check these iMates. These also happen to use iMates um, to take advantage of that relationship over there. Um, and I'll be honest right now that AutoDrop is surprisingly limited in that regard because uh, it only applies to a few particular categories. Like um, I think it only works for bolts. It works for like clevis pins uh, specifically and washers, um, like clevis pins and also washers. And that's not really something that you could fiddle around with too much. Like the categories and all are pretty hard coded, uh, but AutoDrop is limited to a particular set of categories in the content center. And if you want to, you can do stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think I'll, I'll demonstrate here, but if you wanted to, you could get the same AutoDrop functionality if you author this component as one of those categories, right? This is a very, very specific workflow over here that I'm not sure is you know, worth the trouble, but um, it is available. So if you want to, if you want to uh, author a part like a, like a hex head or any of these parts here, um, you could still do these same placement edges, which are effectively going to be your iMates for auto drop down the line. Um, and they don't always apply because I don't have the right geometry here, right? But um, <laughs> some of my testing I, I went through and I did it any without the proper parameter mapping. And you can still get pretty close, honestly, but very much a workaround. So um, I would only recommend you go through this process of authoring for AutoDrop if you're trying to recreate the same type of part for that category. So if you're trying to do a hex head, then yeah, absolutely go and author it so that you get AutoDrop. Uh, otherwise, um, it's not necessarily uh, designed for that quite yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I don't know if you guys are curious, the auto drop feature is configurable on the user side, on the customer side. It's just uh, limited to a few particular categories, and that's further restricted by the type of parameters that are available in your role. So, um, I think I did one here. Which, yeah, maybe we'll see that real quick, actually. So um, I, I configured one for washers, a plain washer over here. You can see I tried attempting this for, I tried authoring some of these dowel parts as washers which doesn't necessarily work as you'd imagine, unfortunately. Um, let's see if this auto drop one sizes properly over here. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't quite size out there. And so uh, my point is that you can get auto drop functionality. It just has to be really particular <laughs> with the categories and the content centers that you're using. So probably not largely recommended um, in my personal opinion, but um, if you're interested in that, that's another way that you could automate constraints. And auto drop for the supported families is relatively useful, I would say, in the first place. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Um, you guys doing all right? Okay. Right on. I hope I haven't lost anyone in this regard here. But from here, right, um, I said my original goal was to, you know, again, configure and constrain these particular assemblies. And so if there's any other questions about iMates or the pattern feature commands, I'm going to move on to my next topic over here. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no over here. And I'm going to say no over here. Okay. So again, those are the kind of two surface level um, levels of complexity that. Most people stumble upon one way or the other. Um, I'm going to posit another question, right? I'm going to say, heck, are we going to constrain something like a keyboard to get up here and do all of these different parts, right? This is really similar to what we've seen so far, right? Where we have some level of symmetry, we have some level of repetition, and you know, these, there's about 70 different caps on the board right here that we have to figure out and um, constrain ultimately, right? And when I started doing this originally, I was like, I really don't want to do all of those constraints. And I tried to figure out a bunch of different ways to kind of save myself time. Um, 
cer certain sub assemblies, do certain pattern features, do like a pattern of points or something like that. And if you look at any of these uh, constraints over here, you'll see that there's about six per, right? So uh, there's constraints attached to the previous and then the next key in particular. Uh, but you can see here each of these keys as presented, they're constrained by the origin planes from the first key to the second key, and then the same for the second one over there. So the spacing is relatively defined by the width of the keys and also in the row that they're in as well. So not necessarily the easiest thing to capture in a pattern command, not necessarily the thing you would want to do times over using imates, right? So what's the solution over here? It's <laughs> And I find a lot of my topics venture into iLogic a lot. And so this is the uh, first times I've done iLogic myself for one of these presentations. So um, please bear with me while I demonstrate what's going on over here. Uh, I'm going to open up a, another part over here. And let's look at a simpler part to begin with. And so um, just for demonstration purposes, I have this full key, um, this whole iLogic script over here already written out. And this is what I've been working on recently. Um, you really need to know is that um, there's a lot of logic over here, a list of keys that's going to specify the particular configuration and orientation of all these keys. And I have a few loops here that are going to um, iterate over the whole uh, selection of those lists. And the big thing about iLogic that's really cool is that, to back to our original topic, right? Um, we're both adding components here, iLogic, and we're also adding constraints using iLogic as well. And so that's how this connects to everything else we've been talking about. You could still place components and you could still train things and you could automate and scale that using iLogic, which is what we've done here in particular. And so there's a pretty big list of parts, but um, again, this is going to go through, this is going to place all of my parts specifically, and it's going to constrain them all accordingly as well. So this is a very particular configuration of all of these parts being placed and constrained right now, which wouldn't necessarily be possible using a regular pattern command. And it's not necessarily possible, but it is possible using iMates, of course, it would just be kind of tedious is the only thing. Um, and so this is going to go through, and it is loading in 70 parts, and so this will take a moment here. Um, and yeah, so I don't know, it's been a kind of a fun thing, and I, I appreciate the opportunity from Nigel team to let me talk about this stuff. <laughs> but you can see now, all these parts are fully constrained, and they're placed in reasonable positions right now, right? And like I said before, these are all individual parts right here. And I can place all of these guys accordingly, like so. Okay. And so that's great. <laughs> Are there any questions about that logic so far? Um, I imagine we, we're just going to go through regular placement of that because um, I think iLogic in general, you know, you do need some kind of coding background to kind of understand what's going on over here. So there's a few different data types right off the bat, right? I'm using list here, for example, defining some strings of file names. And I'm also using these specific uh, commands in Inventor to add and to constraints specifically. But um, let's let's talk about that in the another Scratch file over here, right? So if I look at Scratch over here, this is a simpler one just to show you how it depends on a single instance in particular and how that's going to go through. Um, and we're going to go ahead and just do this code. Eh, yeah, we'll, we'll just go ahead and write go through this code really quickly to see what's happening. Okay. And so um, I think I don't want to do this. I'm going to go ahead and I will code live because I think that's a good idea. So I'm going to take a quick screenshot of this code so I have it off to the side for myself. Um, and we'll talk about how this all kind of breaks down and how you can be, go through and stuff afterwards as well. So um, if you're in a, an assembly file right now, go ahead. I'm going to clear all of these other parts quickly to get back to six. And if you don't have the iLogic tab, you can press the plus sign over here next to the model tab and then include the iLogic tab if it's not already there. And to make a new form, right click, add rule. Um, January ABA. Right, there you go. And so first things first, right? Um, we're going to have to place a component. Oops. And so we place a component. There are these things called snippets left over here. Um, and so again, I, I don't want to go into all of the nuances of this particular program. Uh, but if you could find a particular snippet of code, this is already kind of configured so that 
don't have to do too much, you know, calling and explicit typing out. Um, but for example, under iLogic assemblies slash components, you could click the add component to add a line of code that would effectively add a component to your assembly over here, right? And just to talk about a few of the different bits over here, you do need to go ahead and know what these fields are. And if you mouse over the first block over here, you can get an idea of what each of these are gonna mean to us over here. The, in particular, the first section over here re uh, refers to the occurrence name. So how is this gonna be named in the model browser? Um, occurrence name is particularly important. Second one over here is gonna be the file path slash name of the you're gonna call out. This next field is gonna be the position, grounded, gonna be visible, appearance is gonna be set to a particular instance as well. And before I go much further, I'm going to go ahead and um, call the file path. So I'm going to declare file path as string. And this is a long block of code. And so I'm going to save this really quickly. I'm going to go pull up the file path for this. I don't have to type manually. Okay. Copy. Go back over here. And we're just going to place this in as a copy paste and also add in that last backlash so that this is a proper file path that we end up putting in here after the fact. Okay. And so from here, I'm just going to call this occurrence uh, occurrence A. And then I have to go ahead and call out the file path. And I apologize for kind of breezing over this, but I'm going to use the file path variable, which I declared here as a string, which is this. And I'm going to concatenate it using an ampersand. Um, and call out the particular part that I want. This part is going to be a-1.0.ipt. Uh, that's what it's, that's what's at this location specifically. So this whole section right here reads out as a file path to a particular file. And then it's going to define a position, the grounded date, and uh, anything else over here. For purposes, I am going to call this true for now. So it is going to be grounded uh, at the origin by default. And if I go ahead and save and run this, what do we get? End statements. There we go. Or that immensely. Um, this one. There we go. And by default, it should just place in this part and it should be grounded right off the bat, right? Uh, which is good and doesn't necessarily have any constraints because it's just grounded right now. But then in one more line of code, go ahead and add in another piece. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, in another line right here. So component add, copy, paste. I'm going to name this component B for the program that we have here. I'm going to name this occurrence B. And I'm going to call in a two with a separate file file location. And this is not going to be grounded. I want this to be able to move around and, and have a good time. And so now when I save and run this, it's going to be placing two parts in there. That one part is still free to strain. Again, at this point, right, in a normal assembly, I was gone through, use the manual constraint, or applied an iMate if I wanted to inject my version over there. Um, but the next line that we need over here is going to be the constraint adds. And so down here under relationships, you could find a lot of these uh, constraint functions available to you. And in particular, I'm going to be using add UCS to UCS. And so that's connecting the or planes from one part to another part and setting particular offsets, right? Uh, but you can see if you look at this list close, you're going to see you could do like iMates. And someone already mentioned they were doing some iLogic and they were programming. And iMates um, are able to be called out for that sort of thing really easy as well. So that's a nice tie in with everything else. Uh, but notice you also have like angle constraints, flush, insert constraints, all stuff that we've talked about before. But we're going to kind of automate it and do it through logic in this particular case, right? And if I go ahead and add UCS to UCS, again, some more stuff to play of, right? Like, what does this mean, right? Um, first section here is simply the name of the constraint. So name of, you know, constraint. So this is when you rename a constraint to like, you know, whatever you want it to be. This first field is the occurrence name of the first part, right? Um, and so in this case, is gonna be occurrence A. Um, yes, one is the name of the universal coordinate system that you're calling out, and then this, section over here is going to be B, right? 
and again, this is all kind of in the documentation and stuff. And so uh, if you actually type in origin, that's going to call out the origin plane specifically for these parts, of what we want. And offsets x, y, and z over here, I could go ahead and call in like an inch offset or something like that, right? Go ahead and save that. Hopefully that runs properly. Uh, there you go, right? <laughs> and that's, a, that's an automatic constraint right there. Um, I didn't intend this to be a programming lesson by means, but I just wanted to highlight the individual commands that end up getting used in logic, right? Because by default, you're still doing the same thing you do inside of the regular assembly environment, right? I'm adding a component. I'm constraining those components and stuff like that, right? It's great. It's a good time. But the real advantage of using iLogic is that you can start using programming logic to automate and scale these particular workflows, right? So back to my original script, right? This concept happens over here as well, where again, I have a block down here where I add components and I can these components well. There's some other logic in terms of like getting the first row in there and stuff like that. Essentially, I use a for loop to count out the whole row of everything and these rows are defined up here. And so this allows me to, again, go through, place, constrain each of these individual rows and apply even more additional logic using these if cases and using the parameters to uh, call out and define a regular space they're going to need between keys, right? And so I guess what I'm getting at is that there's a lot more opportunity to kind of expand on these concepts in iLogic than there is in the basic uh, constraints, right? So obviously everyone needs to do constraints if you're working in assembly. Um, however, there's a good chance you want to be doing more than just constraints when you start placing constraints, right? You want to be able to uh, simplify and reduce tedious tasks. And that's exactly what iLogic is for, right? And so in this particular case, right, it helps because let me place all of these keys as I need to individually. Um, and, and yeah, <laughs> does that make sense? I hope that, I hope that, um, I hope that constitutes a, you know, good summary of why I think I look is a good conclusion, a good solution to a particular keyboard uh, assembly over here. Because while there are other ways to simplify your assembly needs and apply your constraints as needed, um, I think logic is good just because it opens up a lot more opportunities for a lot more uh, complexity <laughs> to be introduced over here. Um, any questions about that so far? I think that's about all I want to say on iLogic so far, but uh, any questions here so far? Anybody? Cool. Cool, right on. Cool, right on. OK. <laughs> um, OK, and so from here, I guess just moving on, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint unless there's any questions. Um, Okay, and so just a quick story of everything we're going around. Again, I, I kind of wanted to frame this all in terms of like, what's the best way to do a lot of repetitive constraints, right? Uh, at the first level, use pattern and feature commands, right? Pattern and mirror commands, they both help uh, help simplify and kind of multiply all of the different constraints you have, right? They are kind of dependent on different levels of symmetry stuff, and that's kind of where the limitation of those. So you need a bit of foresight to get those going in the first place. Uh, but in general, if you could inform your part level, that helps um, that's streamline your workflows downstream using assemblies and stuff. So in general, I recommend it to you know make your part files as intelligent as possible. Right? Uh, IMATES is the next level of complexity. Right? It's pretty convenient, you know. I would say, but you know, I don't think it's really that obvious to a lot of people, whether you're trying to make it yourself or if you're trying to um, uh, trying to just use someone else's iPart right all that, right? It's control and then click and drag will glyph to where it needs to be finished and complete the IMA, right? And there is, again, some content center compatibility um, and using auto drop. I would say it is a bit esoteric though, depending on how deep you want to get into content center for sure. Um, logic, however, I think is a solution to everything, <laughs> which it might be a bit of an oversell perhaps, but that's essentially scripting and automating that sort of stuff, right? So reducing any kind of repetitive task is, um, iLogic is a solution for. It's scalable to the user-friendly and um, leads to further automation API. You want to start making you know, add-ins and, you know, whole world's your oyster after that, you know? I would love to, like, expand on this particular code to kind of see where we go from there, but... um. Let me know if you're interested in learning more about that process and see where that code goes from there. But the whole world's your oyster, you know? Bang, there's iLogic. 
there's your oyster. No, whole world's over there available to you guys. Um, yeah, that's about all I got for this presentation. Are there any other questions or curiosities? Oh, Buck McKay, is there a way in iParts to define a feature uh, parentheses length while in a, an assembly? For example, rather than refining potential screw lengths, I define extruded length, extruded shaft, and while placing inside assembly, I could adjust the length in that environment. Um, that is an interesting question. Yeah, as normally it's you know, iParts kind of view predefined entry points, I would say. So you could kind of, you know, pre-quantified lengths available or diameters, like right, for bolts and the like, right? Um, is there a way to have like an open field so it could be anything you want? Probably not with eye parts, I would say. Um, I mean, you could have it such that, I don't think so, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I might be a, a path with logic because <laughs> with you could place a part in there and you could have it prompt you for like the length that you want and then have it update the parameter, I would imagine as a possible workflow. Um, but I guess in the scope of the question, right? I only let you do predefined quantities. It's not really user in at that point. And if it's published in the content center, then you don't get to that part. Um, alternatively, you could go through content center places custom, and then you could update the parameter for length as you'd want to, assuming that's already loaded in the um, part itself. Um, and I think those would probably be, I think that would probably be this, the simplest idea. So just places custom through content center if you'd like. Um, and then you could adjust the length to be whatever you want to. Uh, possible ways to get you input prompts from iLogic as well, if you want to do it that way, but straight up parts and iPart configurations, yeah, yeah, I no, wouldn't use iParts for that. Yeah, yeah, for for iParts specifically, I really find their biggest uses to be um, in the context of like creating content center components. Uh, Absolutely. For yeah. for strictly like design automation and like part creation and stuff, I wouldn't. iParts is not where I would start. Like initially, if you if you look at all the capabilities within Inventor, you would imagine that iParts is probably the way to go. Um, but in actuality, you have so much more flexibility in the context of um, generative design using iLogix. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's another question yeah, here, so. Adam, too, about like uh, oh, recommendations yeah. for naming convention. Oh, sure. Like uh, and, and via iLogix or just a a bit. Oh, go ahead, Adam. Sorry. Oh, oh yeah. So, I mean, like, naming conventions, you're talking about the variable names inside of uh, iLogix specifically? Uh, okay. I would assume so. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure if I do have any recommendations. I, I could say that uh, I know the company here, I, I know our team is a particular, um, whenever they find variables, they always do like lowercase first word and then capital word usually. And so usually something like file path. Um, as I understand, that's like largely ability is consistent. And uh, this way you also identify user, uh, user variables versus user variables, right? Like system variables like, uh, um, like components or add or something like that. Um, and then uh, I know they don't use underscore well, I've heard. And if you get into like object oriented programming, I know some people and even some old iLogic code comes with, um, you'll see people at the O in front, which is, as I understand, a holdover from older object oriented programming where and at the beginning of variable would constitute like an object and object oriented programming. I'll see that as, I don't think this is prevalent anymore though. Is there any other kind of best practice you would say, like outside of convenience, Nigel? Um, I would just make it as descriptive as possible, but as short as possible. Oh, fair, definitely fair, yeah. Because um, I don't think there's any like explicit rules that you have to avoid per se, but um, yeah, like Nigel said, when you get into larger codes, it's just, you know, you're really just doing favors to yourself whatever you name it, right? So make sure you name something well. And um, like I said, I, I believe our practice here at the company is just, lowercase and then capital second word, which I don't know, like just, I'm not sure why I like it, but it's kind of convenient. And camel tech, camel text, that's, that's great. Yeah, there you go. So camel okay. text is the name first, of the Yeah, perfect. Yep, exactly. First letter, uppercase, um, no spaces between words. So if you wanted to make something yeah. called like front corner length, you would capitalize the F, the C, and the L, which is, uh, yeah. I almost tried to make an anime reference there, but there wasn't enough letters. Watch anime, Nigel. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Anything else, Adam? Um, yeah, and so. <laughs> um, well, um, I guess I had one more thing. If you're curious. I, I'm I'm choosing between two color schemes over here. Oh, we do have a question. <laughs> Is there a way to simplify the assembly and reduce the final size due to its uses of hundreds of repeat parts that may be inserted for large or complex machines? Absolutely. Yes. Um, this is, funny enough, yeah, when I named this topic originally, I was afraid that I, <laughs> I would get questions about simplifying. And so and we actually have an ABA, and I, I think I actually worked original ABA for simplifying <laughs> simplify workflows. Um, if you look up here inside of the uh, assemble tab, there's actually a simplification uh, bar over here. And there's various here that uh, might be interesting to you in terms of to um, simplify your uh, assembly. Uh, like you said, a lot of those assemblies, there are many different parts, a lot of levels of detail, right? And like, you know, various levels of complexity. And you don't necessarily want to send a package of parts to everyone that needs to look at this part, right? Um, what's a really common workflow is just straight up shrink wrap, right? Probably the most um, most straightforward way to simplifying your stuff. Wrap essentially wraps everything together and you can determine how much detail you maintain inside of this part uh, moving forward, right? And so for components, for example, do I want a particular design positional level of detail? Do I want to remove any parts in particular? You can go through and click the parts you don't actually want to include. Um, same filters down here. There is a feature filter specific. So do I want to get rid of all the holes? Do I want to get rid of all the pockets, for example? Do I want to get rid of all the fillets and chamfers and the like? Um, you could absolutely do that if you want to. And so, uh, Going over here to the create section, there's more information over here, right? So do I want, how do I want to list this in the materials? What template do I want to use? Um, and you can choose the, I think this part's especially important, right? Do you want it to be a single body? Do you want it to be multiple bodies? Yada, yada, yada. Um, and fill internal voids, for example. Those are all good qualities to kind of use. And so single it's, body, it's, you know, but go ahead, yeah. Yeah, one more thing to add there too is sometimes shrink wrap is not possible because you need some of that information to carry over, right? It's Absolutely. like an internal thing. Yeah. Um, another way to do it is to not use constraints for everything, right? Like it's one thing to like minimize as many constraints as possible, but also use things yeah. like automation to place the component exactly where you want it. Yeah. And if yeah, you do absolutely. that, then yeah. there's less information because the, the mate information or the joint information just doesn't exist, but the part is placed in the location it needs to be based on the other geometry. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. one way to get it. Yeah, but absolutely. It's, it's, it's yeah. Go further down the automation tree, I guess. Yeah. Was, when, I, when I was developing this this rule originally, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's that, that's like, that's a choice you have to make at that point. Do you want to add constraints or do you just want to like place this at a particular position and then ground it? And depending on what you need, ultimately, those are like, you know, essentially equivalent in terms of the final product and drawing, right? As long as your part's stuck where it needs to be stuck, like that's, that's perfect. It's constraint or just a, a positional lock over there. and so uh, like this this file in particular would probably be a pretty large assembly right with all of the different constraints I have here but um, that's absolutely another way to go about it as well take out constraints like Nigel was saying over there um, and you know, so of course just geometric um, simplification over here if I missed that, my apologies. Um, Another question from YouTube, same person. I would like to learn more about iLogic and all these rules. What is this way to do that? Oh, you can check out our uh, AVA YouTube channel. We actually have quite a bit of documentation. Which I personally learned from <laughs> doing all of this stuff. Yeah. Um, so if you just search Kativ AVA on YouTube, I, I know we're running short on time here, Adam. Um, if you just search Kativ no AVA yeah. on YouTube, you'll find them. Um, and there's like 300 videos there now and a bunch of them on iLogic. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a good base here. Um, okay. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's about all I have, guys. Um, I mean, I appreciate the time, you know, thanks for having me as always. And thanks for indulging me. Um, yeah, I, I think we'll leave it at that, man. Let me know if you guys need anything or I'll hand it to you, Nigel. Yeah, I think that's everything we have for today. Um, if you have any questions further, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to Adam and uh, anyone here on our team. Essentially, we'll, we'll make sure to get your stuff answered for you. But, um, but yeah, thanks again, Adam, for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to thank JD for joining us, giving us some information on the ANSYS stuff as well. And uh, yeah, happy Thursday, everybody. We'll see you all next week, same time, same place. Thanks, and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Bye.